Yeah, so I'm going to talk about using ARM pointer authentication to achieve pointer integrity. And with pointer integrity, I mean essentially memory safety for pointers. So we want to prevent an attacker from modifying pointers when they are stored in memory in an effort to modify the, the program's benign behavior. As an example of this, we could consider return-oriented programming, for instance. And in this case, the return address of, of a function will be written into memory where the attacker could potentially corrupt it and then cause the program to return to an incorrect location. But now if we could verify the integrity of the return address before this happens, we would prevent these types of attacks. And in, if we consider a control flow integrity more generally, the, the same would apply to, to code pointers, if we can, which would be used to implement, for instance, indirect function calls. So if you can uh, guarantee their integrity, then these types of attacks would be prevented. And the same applies for data pointers. So by, by um, uh, guaranteeing data pointer integrity, we can greatly reduce the attack surface of, of these type of attacks. And currently, for instance, all known data-oriented programming attacks would be, be prevented if you could guarantee the integrity of all data pointers within the program. But the kind of problem here is that, that how do we now achieve this, this kind of property in, in, in an efficient way so it's actually deployable out in, in, the, in the real world? And this is where, where this ARM pointer authentication comes in. So, so ARM pointer authentication, or PA in, in short, is an upcoming feature in, in the ARM 8.3a CPU specification. So this is going to be available in essentially all upcoming ARM phones. And what PA does is that, that it approximates pointer integrity. And this is done by using a pointer authentication code or PAC, which is embedded into the pointer. And this is possible because the pointer is, is assigned essentially 64 bits, but only a smaller part of that actually is used for the address itself. So, the, so on a default Linux configuration, you would have 16 bits where you can put this PAC code in. The pack itself is a, is a KID, a tweakable Mac, based on the, uh, the uh, address bits of the pointer and then a 64-bit modifier. Uh, the, the PA keys are protected by the hardware and the, the modifiers are set, by the, uh, set through parameter registers for in, by the instrumentation. So you would have some instructions that, that create these packs and then later some other instructions that verify these. So as an example, we can take a look at this GCCs and, and CLANGs implementation of sign return address that, that now addresses this, this return oriented programming scenario I showed earlier. So how this works, works on ARM, that when the function is entered, the return address is going to be in a dedicated link register. And as long as this is in a register, we can assume that the attacker can't modify it. But now, now to allow subsequent function calls, the register must be, be written again onto, onto the stack. And now when the return thread is on the stack, the attacker can go and man manipulate it, causing the function again to, to return to an incorrect location. So the protection here works by, by adding these, these pack instructions before we store the return address that now generate this, this pack and, and embed it into the, the return address itself. And in this case, uh, the instrumentation uses the stack pointer value as a modifier. And then again, before return, after it's loaded from the stack, then we verify that this pack is in, in the intact, and, and based on that, we can now prevent these attacks. The, the attacker could, of course, still, still modify the returners while it's in the stack, but now this verification will, will detect that, causing the subsequent return to, to, to fault. So some maybe, maybe things to note here, that the modifier do not need to be, be confidential. So, so in this specific case, for instance, it's, it's a stack pointer value, which we can assume that the attacker could, could figure out by, by looking at other values or, uh, and analyzing the binary itself. And in our work, we assume that the modifiers are always known by the attacker. This is not, not a problem because the keys are protected by the hardware and, and for instance on Linux, the, kernel would set the process specific keys when the process starts and the attacker doesn't know the keys and therefore cannot generate packs for arbitrary pointers. But now a potential problem is that even though the attacker can't, can generate these, these, uh, these arbitrary packs, maybe the attacker could do something like a replay attack attack. And indeed it turn, turns out that this is the case. We call these, these pointer reuse attacks. And here are some, some kind of simple code that illustrates how this would work. So on the left, you can see two subsequent function calls. On the right, we have some kind of illustration of, of how the stack, stack would look. So when the first function call happens, the, the, the instrumentation will generate the, the pack for the return address and then store it on the stack frame. Uh, this is all fine, but now the problem is that the stack pointer might not actually be, be unique. 
So the stack will naturally grow and shrink during execution. So this will, will, will kind of have the same value at, at several times. Knowing this, the attacker could then potentially read out this, this signed return address from, from the stack frame for later use, and then allow the function to continue execution. And now finally, when we get into to function two, we again generate a new signed return address for this function call and put it on the stack frame. But now because the stack pointer values are, are the same, the attacker can take the previous restored value and put it back on the stack. And now again, because the modifiers in this case happen to be the, exactly the same, this will authenticate normally and then allow the return to go to an in, indirect location. So our goals in, in this work are, are kind of twofold. First, we want to expand the, the protection by, by previous work on PA. So we don't just want to protect return addresses, but we also want to protect data pointers and code pointers. And second, we want to mitigate these reuse attacks as, as efficiently as possible. So for our, our design, the kind of the main consideration is that, that what can we use as a, as a modifier for these, these PA instructions? And the, the first thing to note is that if we don't use a modifier at all, then you can essentially do reuse attacks against any, any pointer. So any pointer generated at runtime can later be used in place of any, any other pointer. And then the, the opposite of this would, would be that we have some unique modifier for each pointer value. And obviously this then would prevent all reuse attacks because now, now the modifiers are, are, are unique. But there are some other considerations we need to know, think about here. The, when we generate a pack, we, we, we need to put some modifier, and later we need to somehow have, when we, this pointer is used at any location in the code, we need to be able to f retrieve the same modifier and again use it here to, to verify this. And at the same time, we must make sure that wherever, however we keep track of these modifiers, they are not controllable by, by the attacker, because if the attacker can swap up the modifiers, their kind of value go, goes away. Some straw man design choices we could consider to, to kind of achieve this is first, maybe we could statically just during compile time look at, look at the, the code base and uh, somehow try to assign unique modifiers. But this is not really possible unless, except for maybe some completely trivial programs. If you, for instance, consider conditionally assigned pointers or pointers that are reassigned at runtime, so then you can't really statically do anything about this. The, the other approach would be that you maybe use a nonce. So every time you create a new pointer, you, you put a nonce in there, and then just when you authenticate, you use the same nonce. But now the problem is that how do you actually track these nonces? So now you have some kind of mechanism in place that keeps track of which nonce you need to use at, at watch, watch, which you use, use place. Uh, and, and essentially, if you, you can do this, that then you could just as well have, have stored the, secure the the pointers in the first place, so why, why use an ONCE in this case at all? And of course, this also has the problem that now you need to somehow secure these nonces. So we have this design we, we call parts, PA-assisted runtime safety. And what we do here is, is at first, we, we expand the, the protection. So we, we now sign return addresses and code, code pointers and data pointers. And secondly, we mitigate these reuse attacks by, by first by binding the return addresses to, to the specific function they were created in. So take, going back to the previous example, for instance, now you could no longer take the return address from function one and put it into function two. And then for code and data pointers, we use the type of the pointer to, to create a modifier we use for this, this signing. So for return address protection, we first know that this, this stack pointer that, that GCC also uses, that's, that's very convenient because to some extent it does change at runtime, so it gives some granularity to this, this protection. But at the same time, it, it's, it, is, it is nice because we also always know that stack pointers has the same value in the beginning of the function and in the end of the function. So we don't need to have any extra kind of bookkeeping of keeping track of these modifiers that we use. But of course, these reuse are, 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 not, are not possible if you only use the stack pointer. So to prevent those or mitigate those, we also assign a, a specific function ID to, to, or combine this, this stack pointer with a function ID. And this is just a unique value to a specific function, which then prevents these cross-function reuse attacks. Uh, for, for code pointer signing, we use, this, we use this, this type of the pointer. So essentially, for, for code pointers, that would be the signature of, of the, the function point and to use that to generate this, this modifier. And in this case, we will use what we call on-use authentication. 
So, so with this, we mean that, that we want a high, high abstraction level inside the compiler. We only uh, instrument the creation of the pointer, and then later, only when the pointer is at some point used, do we instrument that use location. And this has the nice property that we don't really need to care about what happens with the pointers in between. We can just instrument these two locations, and, and it, it doesn't matter whether the pointer happens to go into memory or not in between. Uh, for data pointers, we use a similar scheme for this modifier. For, modifier assignment, although in this case it, it would be the, the pointer to data, data type that def defines the, the modifier. But for, for performance reasons, it's not really feasible here to do this on-use authentication, because if, if you, for instance, consider an iteration of an array, now if on each, each, each use want to authenticate it, we would at each, each loop need to authenticate again and again and again. So instead we want, want to use this on load, so in this case, we would first load the array from, from memory before the loop, and then it would be secure in a register, and then the loop can just go on without any additional authentications. But this now has, has some other implications. We again do the, the instrumentation on a very high abstraction level, but, but this causes now problems when the compiler actually, uh, at the later stage, lowers this instrumentation to, 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 to hardware-specific registers and instructions, it also needs to consider that it has a limited amount of registers, and this might not cause a, a, a register spilling. So essentially the compiler just decides to empty one register, register temporarily into memory uh, to, to free up a register for other use. And now these registers might actually have contained a da data pointer that we now need to, to be able to protect. So we implemented all of this on LLVM 6.0, and we later pointed it to, to 8.0. And most of our, our kind of optimization we do this on this, this higher level, essentially the, the compiler optimizer. But then, then because this is a hardware specific feature, we need to lower this instrumentation to hardware specific instructions that actually do what we need, need it to do. And then we need to, to take care of this, this um, register spilling and, and, and similar kind of low level issues that arise. Uh, so we evaluated our, our, our scheme on NBench, uh, the benchmarking programs. At the time we did this, we didn't have a, uh, any, any PA uh, uh, capable hardware available. So we did all of our, our uh, so we did our functional evaluation on the ARM FPP simulators. So these are, these are functionally equivalent to the, the, the hardware, but they are not cycle accurate. So we could not do the performance uh, evaluation using, using the simulators. So instead, we did this, this estimate of, of how, how much we, we think that the, the PA is, is, is going to, these PA instructions are going to cause overhead. And this estimate was based on, the, on two facts. First, we know from the ARM specification that they suggest that you could use the Karma algorithm to, to implement the, this PA, PA hardware. And from prior analysis of, of the, the Karma algorithm, we know that it's going to have about a four cycle overhead on the kind of CPUs we used here. So the results here, they are, going, they are, are reported and normalized to the baseline, so a value of one would mean essentially no, no overhead. We first tested only this return address protection, and that has had uh, less than a half a percent of overhead. And a similar situation for code pointer signing, so, so again, uh, less, less than one percent. For data pointers, the situation changes quite, quite a lot. Uh, this is also expected, because data pointers are obviously used much, much more than, than code pointers or function calls. And it also depends very much on, 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 on the kind of da data usage patterns of the programs. So like you can see in some of these cases, we had almost no, no data pointers at all, in which case we also saw no overhead. Uh, we also, also did measurements combining all of these, but now because the data, data pointer instrumentation kind of dominates here, there, it's essentially the same as the previous results. So with this, uh, I hope I've uh, convinced you that, that our ARM pointer authentication is, is a useful feature for achieving the pointer integrity. And what, what's particularly interesting about this is that it's going to be available in, in all, all upcoming ARM, ARM hardware. So this is going to be widely deployed. <laughs> but there are, are some, some questions that, that still remain. So can we do something better that we do now to minimize the, this, this scope of attacks? And, uh, in our follow-up work, for instance, we have already shown that, that, that we can do this for return addresses. But what could we do this for data pointers and code pointers? That rem remains to kind of be seen. 
And there's also other upcoming ha hardware primitives. There's going to be ARM memory tagging and, and, and ARM branch target indicator. So can we somehow combine all of these in some kind of new novel ways to get, get something more from what we could get from these in, individually? So with this, I, I, I'm done. So thank, thank you, and I'm happy to answer, answer questions. Hi, John Criswell, University of Rochester. Um, so one, one question I have about your implementation is um, how are you determining the data types for data pointers? Are you using the LVM uh, type information? Yes, we use the intermediary kind of LLVM element types. Okay. To, to uh, you are those. aware that that type system is unsound? Yes, so it doesn't match CC exactly. Well, not only, not only that, but it can be typecasted, you know, if you have unions in your data structures and whatnot. So have you considered how your system would handle that? Yes, so for, for unions, yeah, and uh, we have, have some special code that handles unions, for instance, and especially type, type banning, for instance, we do handle those cases, although it, it requires some, some trickery to, to work around that. Okay, thank you. Hey. Go ahead. All right, so another question. Um, so I, I like the fact that I think what you're essentially doing is using the um, message authentication code as, as a type tag, right? Yes. Um, so have you considered other type systems that you might actually want to apply this to? So um, just kind of as background, uh, we had a fun and interesting uh, ideas paper back at PLDI 2009 where we essentially said if you encrypted pointers with different keys, different, you could use the different keys to essentially express a probabilistic type system thing, right? So I'm just curious whether you've thought about other type systems that you might want to enforce uh, using your mechanism. Um, so you mean other, other types of modifiers like, in, like inputs for this, this back? Well, so for example, you could, you could implement type systems, um, uh, for example, that are, say, like object sensitive or context sensitive, uh, things like that. Yeah, 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 I think that's it's probably a good idea to think about. And we did try to think about other ways where we could use this. And, and this, this seemed like a kind of the most compatible way we could think of that wouldn't cause too much kind of, kind of weird corner cases. Okay. But Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? In that case, let's thank the speaker again.